Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Building Your Own Super Duper Home Lab. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Jeff McDunkin, Senior Staff Member at Counter Hack Challenges, and Jason Blanchard, SANS Pentest Curriculum Marketing Manager. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, Please enter them into the questions window located at the go to went on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Jason. Hello, thank you, Carol. Uh, so I wanted just to thank everyone for tuning in today for the webcast. Uh, the way this all came about is that Jeff wrote a blog post a very long time ago about how to build your own home lab. And it's just incredibly successful. It is always being clicked on. People are sharing it and retweeting it constantly. And so I asked uh, Jeff, hey, would you be willing to give this as a webcast? And he said, sure, because he, he gave this as a talk at Hackfest last year. And so here he is now giving this as a webcast. But I wanted to introduce Jeff McJunkin to you. Uh, I met Jeff for the first time when I uh, started working for SANS. Uh, I introduced him one time as Jeff's brain doesn't work like anyone else's. It works in challenges and puzzles and it's fantastic and it's awesome. And I, I love hanging out with Jeff. Uh, he is also, as of this month, August 2017, the employee of the month for Counterhack Challenges, which is fantastic and he definitely deserves it with the release of NetWars 5.0 and all the other amazing things that he does. So I'm going to turn over to Jeff now who is a fantastic instructor, a great speaker, an awesome person. and Jeff. Ready, it's your turn. Enjoy. Excellent. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Carol. Uh, so, yes, today I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share uh, the, the talk I've been given at a couple of conferences. Uh, Jason mentioned Hackfest, and I've kind of refined it over time and adding more uh, sides to things. So it kind of started out more on the pen test side, because that's honestly what I consider a bit more fun. But I've added some more on the defense, some more on the forensics. Um, for those reading the title slide right now, and you, you got sold on building your own super duper home lab, I apologize. Uh, this is not building your own super duper home lab talk. This is building your own kick-ass home lab. I'm hoping that the kick-ass lab is at least one notch up above super duper. So without further, further ado, let's get started. Um, when the slide moves, there we go. So we have to always have to have the, uh, the who am I. So uh, as introduced, I'm Jeff McShunken, a technical analyst for CounterHack of the senior variety. I've been t uh, teaching for SANS for a couple of years now. I architected the last two major versions of uh, SANS core networks tournament slash experience, uh, 4.0 and 5.0. Um, I have a bit of a problem when it comes to GX certifications. I got to catch them all. Um, I came from the, the defense and operations side, so desktop admin, then a systems and network admin, uh, moved into kind of the offensive world when I started uh, taking more SANS classes, so I became web and network penetration tester, and then I do, I started to counter hack and do whatever it is I do right now. All right, so I always have to have a good table of contents, right? So I'm going to start off with why build a lab in the first place, and I'm hoping to convince you uh, that you need a home lab for continued skills development. Um, there's just not enough you can do um, during your work hours or certainly that most workplaces provide. Um, afterwards, we're going to talk about the hardware. Um, you can bring, of course, any hardware you like. Sometimes your budget requires that you use existing stuff. That said, if you have Greenfield or you have some budget uh, for a new workstation, I'll say something that's a, a nice, healthy bit of overkill. It's also the workstation I'm, from, I'm presenting from right now. And then I'll talk about the, the choice of hypervisors, comparing the type 1 and type 2 hypervisors. I'll talk about uh, getting software, both the operating system and the intentionally vulnerable software. Then I'll talk about my favorite section, if only for the, uh, for the name, stuff on the Internet, right? The DNS, getting your public IP. I'll talk about some example labs, and we'll have a little bit of a wrap-up from there. All right. Without further ado, let's get started. So why build a lab? Well, again, I said ongoing skills development. Most employers are not going to give you, one, the dedicated resources, and two, and probably more importantly, the dedicated time. Um, the, 
Overall, I, I, I build a home lab because we all have interesting questions over time, right? Uh, what type of filtering do we have in place? Could uh, outbound command and control using Meterpreter reverse HTTPS make it through? Well, you mock it up in your home lab. Um, the overriding theme that will uh, come across here is yes, we want to answer interesting questions, but because we're doing this mostly on our own time or very limited work hours, if we're very lucky, um, I'd like to make the home lab kind of as easy as possible to work with. Um, and there'll be a continued theme such that uh, if, if something, I only have so much interest in answering these interesting questions. So if it gets to be a hassle to start up the VM or to connect or to transfer files or to do screen resizing, people tend to just not work with that in their lab, not answer that question. Um, so I, I'd like to make the lab as easy as possible to work with, uh, including building out new VMs or new Active Directory or what have you. And that covers that section, right? Because uh, TLDR, as for uh, why we build a home lab, because our employers, honestly, it, with a few exceptions, aren't going to provide the hardware, software, and time dedicated to it. Right. And frankly, even if they did, you might have interesting questions that might not interest your employer as of that moment. Um, so therefore, you wouldn't be using your work resources. All right, next up, people, when talking about the hardware, they think, right, like these pictures show, this is what you need for a home lab, right? You got your awesome switch there. You got lots of blinking lights. You got a bunch of uh, hard drives spinning around. Um, I posit to you that you probably don't need a whole rack uh, for most any lab you're going to be dealing with, and you probably don't even need dedicated hardware, as in it's only used for the hypervisor. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. So for a given lab, right, the, the, the main limiting requirements are, one, first and foremost, the amount of memory on the system in question. So if you're doing like Microsoft Exchange in your home lab, I, I, the minimum requirements tend to be like, what, eight or 12 gigs for that one machine. Well, that's bigger, but the domain controllers, can they live with two gigs of RAM? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, uh, what I'd like to point out is that uh, since the, the memory requirements are the, the kind of the, the main thing to work with, it's nice if we have a healthy amount of overkill here. Um, also, if you want to do nested virtualization, where you do uh, something like VMware Workstation on your host, and you have VMware Hypervisor, ESXi, running inside of that, each with its own child VMs, that can rip through the RAM very quickly. Also, if you're working on multiple labs simultaneously, it can be a little bit of a hassle to pause some. So having healthy overkill, um, at least on memory, if not CPU, is quite nice. So more specifically, I, I said the word kick-ass for this home lab, and I am hoping to convince you uh, that this lab I'm about to recommend for if you can build your own um, is, in fact, kick-ass. So first things first, awfully server hardware, right? When the Googles of the world, world the Facebooks, the Amazons decommission server hardware, they get rid of it on pennies on the dollar. Um, that said, I just said we don't want to have a rack full of equipment, so that significant other acceptance factor, uh, SOAF, the SOAF, if you will, uh, needs to be appropriate. We can't have this huge, really loud server in our room, right? We can't have the, the box that's downstairs that's also the gaming machine or something being that loud. So it'd be nice to fit it in a quiet desktop case. Uh, and yes, there's a little bit of a higher power utilization with the, the older generations of CPU. Not all that much, honestly. The, the idle's around 60 watts, about five bucks a month. So what am I talking about specifically? Well, the, the next slide has the details, and the slide notes um, mention the, the exact build. But I'm talking about off-lease server hardware in a full tower case. This is not terribly portable in the sense that you're not bringing it to your LAN parties if people still do that. Um, but I'm talking about building a, a kind of a combo that's pre-built using uh, used server hardware, or uh, battle-tested, if you prefer, over used. Um, and then the, the second major limitation that people have with home labs is the amount of uh, disk I.O. available. Not disk space, but disk I.O. And that's where solid state comes into play. So um, having the, the nice, healthy overkill of this hardware 
which this Natex build is, let's see, move to it, there's the specifics. Uh, this specific build is dual eight core Xeon, so 16 cores total, 32 threads, hyper threading, and 128 beautiful, beautiful gigabytes of ECC DDR3 RAM. And of course, uh, more slots for add-in cards and such, uh, but this build comes with the case, the power supply, the motherboard, the two CPUs, the memory. Um, you still need to add your own uh, hard disk, right? I tend to prefer solid states whenever possible. Uh, and in fact, I would go so far as to say, if you're planning to want, run more than one VM, plan on solid state, right? Uh, especially if it's on the Windows side, frankly. Uh, Windows tends to consor consume more disk I.O. than your very idle Linux boxes. Right, so though the screenshot just shows the motherboard right now, it does include the CPU coolers, the motherboard, the RAM, the CPUs, the power, the power supply, and everything. Right? So uh, it used to be that they only sold the, the motherboard kit by itself, and you had to buy the tower and such, uh, but they since started selling the, the pre-built workstation with, in fact, the same stuff that I use. So uh, building your own PC, Right, it, it's, it's like Legos for adults, and it's far more fun because you get something extremely useful out of it. Um, and again, this is an extremely quiet workstation. So those are giant heat sinks. The power supply, or the uh, CPU coolers there um, run really, really slowly because they don't need much. Um, when it's idling, it's not doing much heat at all. So uh, honestly, when I turn on my external hard drive, which is next to my computer, that external hard drive is much more loud than my desktop. So the significant other acceptance factor is a, a big old checkbox here. Right. Before I move on to hypervisor, Jason, do we have any uh, questions for this section? Uh, just mainly a real quick one was, uh, would you be willing to do an, an AMA on uh, reddit.com slash r slash home lab? Sure, absolutely. In fact, I, I often <laughs> uh, sit inside of slash r slash home lab. So, uh, I, yeah, absolutely. So, Sean, that was for you. Now I'm moving back to, go ahead, uh, you're good, Jeff. Okay, so next up we'll talk about the hypervisor itself. Um, I have a bit of a bias. Uh, I like the convenience of a type two hypervisor. So for those not uh, caring about the terminology, which is totally fine, a type one hypervisor is where the, the kernel of the host operating system itself is doing the virtualization. This is things like VMware's ESXi, uh, Hyper-V, because it's in the NT kernel, uh, this counts uh, Zen server, and even uh, Linux's KVM, the kernel uh, virtualization built into the uh, Linux kernel itself. We also have type two, which is where you run your normal operating system and you have an application inside. So this is your parallels, this is your VMware Workstation, this is your VMware Fusion, this is your virtual box. Um, and then specifically why VMware? It's because most of the things that you download, the pre-built appliances, they're usually for VMware. Um, you can try to transfer them, and that's fine. Maybe you could uninstall the old VMware tools, install the virtual box extension. Uh, honestly, I'd rather avoid that hassle, right, recurring theme here. Uh, so I tend to uh, recommend specifically VMware Workstation. Yeah, it's like a what 160 bucks or 200 bucks um, for each new version, um, but you can stick with the a slightly older version now. For example, version 14 came out like the last two days, and I haven't yet upgraded. My home lab continues to function nonetheless. All right? Um, limitations of running on one box. Well. You can't really go over how much memory you have on that one box, but with 128 gigs, that's you know a few dozen VMs conservatively, right? Your Windows 7 client VM with one or two gigabytes of RAM, well, that's you know 50 or 100 of those VMs could run simultaneously. Not really a limiting factor for most home labs. Now, uh, the other thing that comes into play is you can do a really complicated networking inside this one VMware workstation uh, box, if you want to separate out multiple uh, network interfaces or do stuff with multiple VLANs and have it touch other systems, like uh, se separate Cisco switching, it gets more complicated. I'm not gonna say impossible, uh, but honestly that's where it becomes complicated enough that people tend not to use their home lab as often because it's just so much overhead to deal with it in the first place. 
Hey, Jeff, I got a quick question. What core OS do you use on the workstation? Uh, so question, the, which core OS? I personally do Linux, so Ubuntu 1604. Uh, that said, more and more with virtualization, your host OS is just a choice of where, what window management do you like, right? We're all going to be running some virtualization anyway. Um, you're not going to get a Mac OS running on this, but you could do Windows just fine on this specific build. You could also do uh, Linux or, well, that's about your choices. Thanks, Jeff. Uh-huh. All right, so people come back and say, well, VMware Workstation, that's less efficient than ESXi itself, the hypervisor version. And I, to that, I respond, yeah, absolutely. It is less efficient. Um, however, that's where the overkill comes back into play, right? 16 cores means that even if for CPU-heavy tasks, it's only you know, 85 to 90% efficient compared to you know, running on hardware, that's still good enough for a lab even though it's not the 95 to 98% efficiency you'd get with uh, ESXi itself. All right. So I don't care what your host OS is, whether it's uh, Windows or Linux, uh, but having a Type 2 hypervisor has a lot of advantages. All right. And, and in fact, a couple more things to mention on uh, VMware Workstation. All right. For those who have dealt with uh, remote ESXi, right, you right-click Open Console. The fact that that takes a few seconds is annoying. If I resize that little window for that virtual machine, does the VM notice and resize its desktop? Usually not. What happens if I want to copy-paste like something I downloaded on my host to a remote virtual machine? Oh, in that case, we've got to use something like uh, SMB, right? Or maybe remote desktop and really slow file share that way. This, and then VMware Workstation, no, I, I copy and then I paste and it makes it to the VM. VMware Tools works very nicely for these local VMs. So it's a continuing theme of it's easier to work this way, and as a bonus, like you can dedicate your hardware to ESXi, but then you don't have a, a workstation as well. So it being simplified, this is right next to what I'm doing my day-to-day -day work on. So I can just launch up a, a couple more VMs on this same machine, be able to copy-paste software back and forth, um, be able to copy paste clipboard back and forth. I'm doing stuff with like uh, PowerShell launchers for Meterpreter or for PowerShell Empire. Um, being able to just copy paste and uh, automatic screen resize. These are some of the niceties you get with a Type 2 hypervisor that I think make it strongly worth considering. I'm not going to say you're wrong if you're doing Type 1 hypervisor, ESXi, for example, um, but I, I think you're accepting some hassle, and I'm not sure you're getting enough of a, a, a good trade-off for it. All right, once we have any questions on that, moving on to software. So Microsoft software, right? Microsoft licensing. And everyone in the, in the chat room collectively takes a big sigh, right? Ugh, Microsoft licensing. Well, the good news is for your home lab in particular, you don't need money or at least a lot of money uh, licensing your Microsoft product. So uh, one resource I love is modern.ie. Um, with modern.ie, and I'm going to break out of this, modern.ie uh, is from Microsoft pre-built Windows virtual machines, Windows client virtual machines. So if I click, if I uh, see over here where it says virtual machines, I click on that, and I'm getting to the screenshot I have uh, inside the presentation itself. Now, this is what I love, good old drop down. What do you want? Do you want Windows 7 32-bit? Do you want Windows 8.1 32-bit? Do you want Windows 10 64-bit? And do you want the original Windows 10 or the kind of the latest and greatest? Um, now, I wish I could tell you that you should just, because these, uh, these expire after 90 days, and I wish I could tell you that you should just make a snapshot so you can revert to snapshot. Uh, but that would be wrong of me to say, right? I am not a Microsoft licensing person. Um, that said, I'm, I'm kind of okay with it because Microsoft seems to say it. These virtual machines expire after 90 days, and they recommend setting a snapshot when you first install it so you can roll back to it later. So I couldn't tell you to set a snapshot and revert to snapshot after 90 days, but Microsoft can, and I'm okay with letting them do that. So if I select the virtual machine, let's do Windows 7, Internet Explorer 11, 
and you can choose uh, mostly any hypervisor of choice. I'm going to do VMware here. Download zip file. There we go. And there went my bandwidth during my presentation, right? Super, super simple. I love it. I'm going to cancel that download because it's one I already have it. Um, and in the slide notes on this slide, I do have, by the way, um, they took off Windows XP because it's horribly unsupported at this point, right? But it still might be useful for a lab. Um, and strangely, they took it from, away from the dropdown, but the actual file is there. So uh, you can see it now before I go back to the presentation, the actual link, you can see that as well. All right. Any questions so far, Jason? Yep, you're good. Keep going. All right. Forging ahead. Uh, on the Windows Server side, I actually have even better news. If you sign up for a Windows trial from Microsoft.com, yes, they'll send you a few nag emails of welcome to Server 2012 R2 or welcome to Server 2016 um, kind of promo of what's new. Uh, but you don't have to, uh, when you activate them, you get 180 days of an unlicensed copy, uh, which is honestly longer than most of my labs tend to last. Uh, if you want full editions, though, uh, well, you used to have something called MSDN, the Academic Alliance. Um, but then some new Microsoft product manager got in charge of it, and it was promptly rebranded Microsoft DreamSpark. Uh, but then that particular Microsoft product manager moved on, and now it's called Microsoft Imagine. Uh, um, so through your, if you have any affiliated colleges, essentially if you have access to a .edu uh, email address, you can often get uh, full editions of Windows client and server software, and maybe even Office, depending on what they signed up for. Um, which can help quite a bit. That said, many of you on this webcast, if, you, if your work has the MSDN licensing, you probably already have uh, the ability to use uh, your MSDN licenses for home lab stuff as well. Um, so you may want to ask about that if it's something that your work could provide. Because that way they're just providing the software and it costs them zero dollars, um, which is a much easier proposition to make. All right, as far on the Linux side, uh, good news, right? It would be awesome if there were pre-built Linux virtual machines that were intentionally vulnerable in lots of ways, right? Had one piece of software, lots of plugins installed, and even older versions uh, still available. Uh, so I love turnkey Linux for this. I'm going to peek ahead, actually. So on the turnkey Linux side, for example, we have, uh, uh, I don't think it's on the slide, but there's uh, the WordPress turnkey Linux. It's pre-installed older version of WordPress, because, right, if, you wanted, if you're testing a tool like WP Scan, the WordPress scanner, you don't want the latest and greatest, and you also want plugins installed, and preferably some older plugins so you actually have some findings, some vulnerabilities. Uh, so with Turnkey Linux, you can download a pre-built VMware virtual machine with WordPress, as this example, installed with additional plugins, and it's all the older version. Really, really ideal. Right? So if you want a kind of a stand-in for vulnerable WordPress server, you just download their older WordPress server. Done. Um, I will say that the Metasploitable project, so we know of Metasploit, the project, the Metasploitable virtual machine is a product by Rapid7 uh, that is it's supposed to be an intentionally vulnerable Linux machine. Many, many ways you can get on it. Lots of uh, backdoored FTP software to get on, known username and password. It actually, one thing I really like is it bundles a number of intentionally vulnerable web applications as well inside that same virtual machine. So if you want to kind of mock up a some vulnerable Linux machine, just put Metasploitable in that spot on your network, um, and it works great for that. Uh, one shout out, a very recent project, as in just kind of re-announced this last week or so, uh, SecGen can build unique virtual machines that are vulnerable in, in specific ways. Um, so so uh, this one does use uh, VirtualBox, which is fine. Um, you could convert it if you wanted to, or you could try to integrate the two, which is also possible. Uh, but SecGen, each time you build it, um, you can give it scenarios or just uh, have it build the kind of the, the default one, uh, will have a class of vulnerability and select one random example and build that into the virtual machine. So it's great for being able to hand out in classes and such. Right? And then uh, on turnkey Linux side, uh, those older versions, because they're kind of big downloads, right? Uh, most of the mirrors tend to drop those older versions. But uh, before this presentation started, I double checked that the Linux, that I, uh, sorry, the, uh, the mirror I have up on screen, the mirror.vinimac.org, 
uh, still has those older turnkey Linux builds uh, for you to download, because those tend to be more exploitable, which is nice for our home lab. All right, we have the turnkey Linux slide. Ah, on the Windows side. So <laughs> we've all been there, right, with our new uh, Windows machine. And then you have no third-party software installed. So what do you do? Well, you, you, oh, I need 7-zip. So I go to 7-zip.org, download that one. Oh, then I need, uh, I don't know, Steam, or I need some other software. Right? We go through this for the first few weeks of using a new Windows system. All the software that we commonly install, but it just you don't install it until you get the reminder of it. Um, and then, uh, so I'll mention more about 9-night momentarily. Uh, but as for vulnerable services, uh, IceCast uh, 2.0.1 and below have a known security flaw that is extremely exploitable and extremely stable. So if at any point when you're mocking up a home lab, you need some vulnerable Windows system uh, as a stand-in for whatever vulnerable service you want to deal with, um, I like IceCast. I have the direct link to the download here. Um, but when you start it, it it's what, port 8000 and gets you code running or gets you Meterpreter sessions running as uh, by default, the, the administrator. So quite nice for dealing with. And then there's the Metasploit module that's corresponding to it. All right, more on Ninite. Uh, so I like Ninite.com. You go to just Ninite.com. You hit the check boxes for the stuff you want. So here I selected uh, Chrome, Python, Notepad++, and Putty. Uh, let's say I like Foxit Reader. And I think that'll do. So I'll click Get Your Ninite. It downloads. Uh, a nine nights program, very small, so this one's 412 kilobytes, because it's not really the, the installers themselves bundled in. They always, this, this little uh, stager, let's say, uh, downloads from the, the original author's site each of the pieces of the software and then installs it silently in the background. So let's do one screenshot there. So when I run that program, all of those pieces of software I selected, it downloads them one by one, installs them in the background. And, uh, and by the way, if, I, if for example, I was installing Chrome, the downloads keep going afterwards. So they'll do the, the downloads ahead of time whenever possible, which is quite nice. All right, so Notepad++, for example, because it's a better Notepad. Um, I mentioned LibreOffice or Paint.net, which I happen to like, WinDIR stat. Uh, Python is a, is a quick installer. Yeah, I think they even has, have Visual Studio Code in there. All right, so all this stuff on a freshly installed Windows box, which is great for your home web as well. The other shout out I'll give um, for things you might want to include in your kind of templates, if you're building a template virtual machine, is the Sysinternals suite. The so Microsoft Sysinternals, the Sysinternals suite is a uh, one download, one zip file of all of the latest and greatest of the Sysinternals tools for admin purposes. Hey, Quite nice. Jeff, I got a, two quick questions. Sure. Uh, one is, are they the full versions of the programs on, on Ninite? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. it's, it's, I've actually done it with Wireshark to double check. It's downloading from that author site, the, the, the original full version that you would otherwise install. And then um, the second if, question was, is it the like old vulnerable versions of the software or the latest and greatest of that? Uh, for Ninite, it is the latest and greatest, absolutely. Um, so this is more for your admin purposes, right? Uh, you're on your Linux, uh, sorry, you're in your Windows VM, but you want to access your Linux server. You're like, oh, I need FileZilla installed. Well, the second item under developer tools is FileZilla. So if it's part of your, it's kind of your standard build, you just ran this one Ninite program that you downloaded, you get a bunch of utility stuff that you almost always want on your new Windows machine. So this is not the vulnerable software. This is the useful software that, you know, we might find vulnerabilities later, that's not the intent of this program in particular. Good question, though. All right. Next up is stuff on the internet. All right. So sometimes you need your own legit domain. Um, so you could go to you know, GoDaddy, or I t tend to prefer Namecheap, and pay for those. Um, but I, I do like that some top-level domains are actually available for free. So I have the link to Freenom here. And you actually have a basic DNS server included as well. So the .tk domain, the .ml, .ga, .cf, and .gg or .gq 
um, are all free top-level domains. And in fact, when I walked through uh, at Enom Labs, I, I got JRM Labs, so Jeffrey Ronald McJunk in my initials, .tk. I, I put it to you that uh, Freenom is really bad at upselling. Because I was selecting jrmlabs.tk for free, and I said, hey, we should try to upsell you. So here's jrmlabs.ml for free as well, and .ga. Um, I, maybe they'll make up for it in volume, but I'm not sure that's quite how economics work. Uh, either way, I'm really happy to accept their, uh, their offer. Right? Sometimes, though, more than just a <laughs> legit uh, domain name, you may need a, a public IP. Yes, you could use your own uh, IP all allocated by your local ISP, your, your charters or what have you. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be filtered. You're using that. And frankly, I have a, a policy that if I'm out for travel of some kind, my, my home network has to be simple enough that my fiance can figure out how to fix it while I'm gone. Um, and if, if anything adds more complexity there, because I could, yes, I could do uh, PF sense as my home router and just have a separate wireless controller and that's fine but I'm gone often enough that if that has a problem like hey honey you need to reboot the ESXi hypervisor and then connect in and restart the PF sense virtual machine that's not going to go over well right significant other acceptance factor here so I keep my home network extremely clean extremely easy and simple to work with um, and then again for the the Yes, you have a public IP usually assigned by your ISP, but it's a little bit more hassle to deal with, right? We're using uh, our home wireless router, may not have the capabilities we want, may not have TCP dump, Wireshark, um, it's just more of a hassle. So an internet accessible host, a uh, public IPv4 address, uh, when it comes to things like uh, DNS servers being authoritative, authoritative DNS server, uh, you just need a public IP, honestly. Uh, I tend to like DigitalOcean here, uh, so they call them droplets for their virtual machines, but it's, it's five bucks a month for their lowest end one, and it gives you enough resources to be able to work with uh, most projects just fine. So you get your uh, name server record, right, the thing that says which DNS server is authoritative, pointed at that new public IP address, and then things like DNSCAT, right, from Ron Bose, who I hear uh, we may be trying to poach. Um, so yes, you can point your name server there. Now, some people ask, hey, why don't I just build my own name server? Well, I have the appropriate types of GIF reactions to that, right? Why would I build my own DNS server? Uh, nope, 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 nope. Why would I build my own DNS server? Uh -uh. See, that's my face when I think about building my own DNS server. Well, at least specifically when it comes to buying. If it comes to be a hassle to do something involving your home lab, you just won't do it. I am, I'm a firm believer in uh, people do what they're incentivized to do. Yes, I want to find the answer to my interesting question, but I also don't want to deal with, oh, I got the syntax wrong for bind, or I forgot to increment the serial so my caching DNS server didn't notice the new record, right? It, the, the, the nice little goo you get with Freenom DNS Manager uh, <laughs> you could buy another free domain, or you could, if you wanted to, if you want to do something enterprise ready, something extremely overkill, Amazon Route 53, one of the Amazon web services. It's not a whole new VM, it's just a DNS server, but it's in every single data center that Amazon runs out of. It's uh, 50 cents per domain per month, and then this is where they get you, right? It's not the, uh, the printer, it's the cartridges. It's uh, 40 cents per million queries. That's, that's a lot of queries. Um, in my home lab, I, I, I do considerably fewer than one million queries per month. Um, and then I want to point out, you can return private IP addresses. So if I want uh, ad.jrmlabs.tk to be out on the internet, right, provided by Amazon Route 53, you can absolutely do private IP addresses from those public DNS servers. Yes, you are leaking your internal addressing, but it's a lab. I don't terribly care if somebody knows that I use 10.10.10.10 as my uh, primary DNS server slash domain controller in my home lab, as an example. I will tell a few hundred of my closest friends on the webcast, for example. All right, any uh, questions here, Jason? Anybody uh, just really defending on. Bind? No, what was the uh, website address again for Freenom? Oh, it's, uh, I think it's just freenom.org.com. It's in the slides, but... Uh, 
Freenom.com. www.freenom.com. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Uh -huh. Keep going. I have to make it past all of my gifts now. I have to chuckle. <laughs> all right. So when it comes to putting together complex networks in VMware Workstation, I have some, uh, some scars from having dealt with this before, and I, I will uh, give you the, the benefit of those. You can kind of skip over some of these things. Uh, there's a couple of pre-built networks available. So you know of the bridged networking, which has uh, your VM appear as if we're on the same switch or wireless network your host itself is connected to. You have the pre-built NAT network, uh, which is usually VMNet 8, where it's behind, uh, the, the virtual machine is behind your host in much the same sense that you're behind your NAT router that you connect to your ISP itself. Um, technically, you can do something called LAN segments. That's uh, a, a, an isolated network that your host has no visibility into. Um, the nice thing is, well, you don't have any issues with your host interfering with stuff or your host stealing IP addresses. However, uh, you, your host can't get to those networks, so you end up making a virtual machine that also has access to that network, and you assign it an IP address that can reach the other one. It's just more of a hassle. So I will say if you're setting up complicated networks, I recommend doing new VMNet interfaces. This is for uh, Windows uh, uh, Workstation and Fusion, essentially. Uh, both. Now, the host can access everything inside your lab, which I think is a good thing. If you want to intentionally limit where you can come from for the sake of walking through a particular attack workflow, for example, if you're doing the offensive side of home lab, uh, then you just set up one virtual machine that has the interface that you're uh, expecting. Uh, so then we'll walk through that in this uh, example coming up. So uh, VMware does steal the dot one and dot two of every new subnet that you create with VM the interfaces. Um, I don't think this is, this is annoying, yes. It's, it's kind of hard to work around if you wanted to reassign that. Uh, I would say do dot 254 for your gateway if you want to do that. So if you want to have PF sense, do your routing inside your home lab, which I strongly recommend, uh, just have its IP address be dot 254 in every new subnet. Um, don't, don't fight VMware, just work with it. Uh, you don't have to do dot one or dot two for your gateways. Yes, it is common to do so, but there's no requirement for any means. In fact, keen observers playing uh, NetWars Tournament 5.0 will observe that the gateway is dot 254 in each of the uh, later submits you encounter. It is absolutely for this exact reason. Because I'm mocking it up on my home lab in VMware Workstation, and I wanted to use PFSense to route between those networks, but dot one and dot two were stolen by my host. Hey, uh, Jeff, quick question here from William. Do you have a yeah. few VMware workstation screenshots or network diagrams for your home lab to ease setup time? Uh, the, do, I, do I have pre-built uh, kind of the, the screenshots to, to work from? Uh, I do not. Um, I think that's one of the things I want to do for an upcoming blog post is walking through this example enterprise lab network uh, that I'll be introducing here. Uh, but in this specific one, um, well, well, we'll walk into it, and I'm happy to take questions at the end to, to try to get people on the right track before this blog post comes out. Good question. All right, I want to reiterate. So I'm about to talk about a more complicated lab network. And in fact, it's a more complicated lab network than I think most questions need to be able to answer. Um, so kind of one more call for simplicity. If you want to deal with one particular question, usually, Honestly, that's one or two or three VMs in the same subnet, right? There's less stuff to fail, therefore it's less hassle. Therefore, uh, it's not going to, with less hassle, we're more likely to actually kind of push through until we find the answer, right? So here's, I say basic, but it's probably more complicated than many things need. Example, enterprise network. So we already have uh, the NAT uh, pre-built uh, virtual machine network, right? This is where it's behind your host, the private IP address. Um, so I'm going to say three interfaces uh, on a PF sense virtual machine. Use it to route between these networks. So I have the internet side, which is just the NAT. I have DMZ. So I tend to make uh, 10, 10, 10, uh, dot VR slash 24, and that'd be VMNet 1, because it's 10, 10, 10, and then VMNet 2 is 10, 10, 20. Right, just matching VMNet to the third octet. So I'd have DMZ as 10, 10, 10, 
and that's an, uh, a host only network. So your host can see it, but that network itself doesn't have internet access. But because PSense has uh, an interface in the internet, the NAT subnet, it can get out to the internet. On the internal side, 101020 slash 24 is another host only network. And again, dot .254 because workstation or fusion steal dot .1 and dot .2 for its own uses. All right, so the virtual machines installed. Um, as a, some attacker machine, some people like Kali and that's totally fine. I say one interface and have it on the NAT network. So that's coming, an attacker coming from quote unquote the internet, right? And we have a pair of intentionally vulnerable machines. Well, one intentionally vulnerable and one that happens to be vulnerable, right? Turnkey Linux with WordPress has a bunch of vulnerable stuff. So let me just tell you that flat out. But if you wanted to have an easier place to pivot through, the Metasploitable version 2, I said that's a good stand-in for an exploitable virtual machine, and I stand by that. So we give those VMs two network interfaces, one on the DMZ side, right, so that's the, the NAT network, same as the Kali VM. We also give it uh, an interface on the internal side. That way, if you, gained, if you compromise that machine, you could pivot from one to the other. This is a great work through for uh, on the exploitation side. But defenders will note that the same lab, when I talk about this later, can be used to how could I block this attack. And forensic folk could uh, pause any of these VMs at any point, grab the memory capture or grab the uh, network packets that are going through and uh, see what artifacts are left behind over the network and in memory, right? And then I, I tend to like uh, Server 2008 R2 or 2012 R2 or 2016, right, as your internal domain controller and some Windows client. Here I'm choosing Windows 7. So with these machines set up, I, I could log into Kali, and this is where a kind of call for simplicity and call for making things easy, make SSH really convenient from your host OS. So if you're using Windows as your host OS, uh, I would say set up key-based logon with PuTTY and make a shortcut on your desktop, right? Double-click receive new shell on your Kali machine. Because otherwise, it's a bit of a hassle to make it there. Right? And you want copy-paste to work just really nicely. Putty is great for that. <coughs> All right, from Kali, I'd say exploit either your Metasploitable box or your WordPress box. Now you have a new uh, level of access to this dual-homed machine. Well, that means you can add a route to that internal network, and you can exploit, for example, IceCast as a stand-in for a vulnerable service on a Windows client. And if the uh, passwords are the same on that Windows client and the Windows server, we could demonstrate pass the hash attack with dumping hashes on that Windows client, exploit the server, and dump, for example, domain hashes or just read some file to prove that you have access. Um, like on, on the, uh, uh, when it comes to, I don't know, like karate, taekwondo, people go through kata, right? This is the, the pre-built flows that they go through just to make sure they know how things work, keep things in mind. Um, going through this exercise with Metasploit is a great kata uh, for people on the offensive side, right? If you wanted to learn how, for example, this task would work with uh, PowerShell Empire, well, you could still work through the same idea using a different tool, right? Same kata, different uh, tool set. And then, of course, uh, if you want to uh, work through on the defensive side, right, this same lab is great for the forensic side, great for the defense side. Uh, the .vmem file, when you pause a, a virtual machine, Linux or Windows, is a bit-for-bit -bit copy of the memory of that VM. And volatility uh, recall frameworks both support the .vmem format. Right? Uh, there's more details in the slide notes here, which I'll t uh, mention the slides at the end. Uh, but you can also set up Windows event forwarding, right? centralized logon, see how that works. If you want additional things to be logged, really, really useful stuff. right? Uh, Sysmon by Sysinternals, the second time I've plugged it in the same talk. Um, InfoSec Taylor Swift uh, did a nice kind of pre-built uh, configuration for Sysmon, excluding, I don't care if a new Microsoft signed driver is in use, but please tell me if another device driver suddenly uh, is in use across my enterprise, right? Or tell me if there's PowerShell.exe being called by PowerPoint.exe or WinWord.exe. Really, really useful stuff to be able to send. Uh, Syspawn just sends it to the local Windows event log and then use uh, Windows event forwarding or some other tool to centralize that, All right? And then uh, as a great example, in fact, I love I, people on the defense side, the forensic side, and even people on the offensive side, 
should probably be interested in this JP CERT blog I mentioned here, Detecting Lateral Movement Through Tracking Event Logs. JP CERT, the, the Japanese uh, Community Emergency Response Team, uh, went through a lot of offensive tools with, uh, on machines that had Sysmon enabled and saw what signs of their use were uh, uh, logged in the Windows event log. Really, really useful stuff. Right? It's a great example of uh, walking through on the defense and forensic side, in fact. And attackers, we should be knowing what artifacts we're leaving behind when we're walking through using specific tools. <laughs> Jason, any questions here? Uh, mainly comments. I would say that uh, at some point, I think a lot of people are going to want to continue to this conversation afterwards. So either that AMA or your uh, Twitter account would be great for the people who would Absolutely. like to keep going. So. I I am moderately certain I have a slide coming up with my Twitter handle. <laughs> All right, another example lab, uh, Raphael Mudge actually created a, a, a freely available set of virtual machines. It is absolutely focused on going through with Cobalt Strike, which is his paid piece of software, but he does have a trial available, 21 day, I believe. Um, and he has an uh, entire series, Advanced Threat Tactics Material, uh, which is online and available for free. Really good stuff to walk through. All right, if you're looking for something fun to do on a Friday night, right? If, if it's me, I get like my nice glass of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, a new virtual machine from Bone Hub, and I start hacking around, right? A lot of these are so-called boot and root, where you're supposed to boot the downloaded virtual machine. In theory, you're supposed to notice what uh, DHCP IP it took, get a limited foothold on that machine via some vulnerability, and then privilege escalate to root. They're really fun exercises, and if you get stuck, they have really good walkthroughs available. Uh, so you can, and there are plenty of them. So frankly, if you read the walkthroughs for, for uh, many of them, that's fine, because there are many, many more where sometimes you start going to get, uh, oh, this sounds like a vulnerability I have seen elsewhere. And now you just, you know, because of reading those walkthroughs, because of walking through those exercises, you've taught yourself to recognize uh, how a vulnerability seems to appear. Uh, Syracuse University also has the SEED project with downloadable virtual machines with a specific challenge and then the corresponding walkthrough. So I have a screenshot in this next slide. So for example, um, if this were a physical audience, I'd say, hey, how many people have exploited a shell shock vulnerability before? That's awesome. Thanks for raising your hand. I saw that, right? Everyone has their webcams on. So there's a shell shock vulnerability lab uh, that Syracuse University made. So you can walk through as a <coughs> Uh, a, a shell shock vulnerable VM, right? We all remember where we were when shell shock came out. Same for Heartbleed, right? Um, if you want to walk through uh, exploiting set UID binaries, uh, buffer overflows, return to the libc, all sorts of really valuable stuff in the seed lab. So I want to mention that there, right? So what else can I do? Well, I happen to work for this little company called Counterhack, Counterhack Challenges. Um, I hear we make challenges that are for free every year. Uh, we have great write-ups and we keep them online, right? So if you ever shell shock the system, like I mentioned with Syracuse University, well, if you do that, it gets an online system without even having to spawn up your own local virtual machine. But if you ever read data from a remote box using Heartbleed, right, the vulnerability in OpenSSL that allows you to read some chunk of memory from the remote machine, really, really powerful stuff. So uh, those two vulnerabilities are absolutely in the 2014, 2014 Holiday Hack Challenge. So you can try it out. So there are many of these Holiday Hack Challenges. They've been doing them for years. I've been involved in the last few. Um, but here you go, Christmas Hacking Carol, the 2014 Holiday Hack Challenge. Really, really great stuff. And of course, we all have the theme. Ed takes the story very seriously. We really spend some time on it, right? So it's very similar intro to A Christmas Carol. Marley's ghost, right? Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. And it turns out Marley is his main, is Scrooge's main hacking machine. And somehow, even though it's been decommissioned, he signed the paperwork himself, Marley is back online. Same IP address, same MAC address, same SSH host key. And Marley uh, tends to walk through uh, with Scrooge some of the, his own faults. And you'll answer some questions that come out as part of this challenge. Quite fun. All right. If you're just signing in now, <laughs> here's the too long didn't listen slide. Right? The hardware, there's some slide notes. 
Uh, the base build is $875 for 128 gigs of RAM, 16 Xeon cores running at 3 gigahertz, and you need to add uh, at least some uh, disk to that, uh, preferably some video card as well. Uh, hypervisor, VMware tends to be kind of winning the game. Uh, VMware Workstation I tend to prefer because you can use the host for other stuff. You don't have to have a dedicated box. This can be your everything machine because 120 gigs of RAM is useful for other things too. Uh, if you're looking for Windows OS stuff, Modern IE gives you a client OS for 90 days. You can get uh, server trials for 180 days, also free. On the Linux side, we have Turnkey Linux uh, and Metasploitable version 2. All right. We are now to the questions slide. So this is my Twitter handle. I'm Jeff at counterhack.com for email. Uh, these slides are online at bit.ly slash kickasslab. Um, they'll also be sent in PowerPoint form. Uh, or PDF form, I believe, uh, to those joining this webcast. All right, Jason, I want to do a couple minutes to catch up, or should I move into a little bit of bonus material first? Um, if people have questions, now's a good time to ask. Um, okay. Uh, here's a real quick question. Any tips for making Win server setup easy to main controller? Uh, questions, uh, so how do we make Windows server setup easy? Honestly, uh, I, I tend to not involve all that many. Yes, there are some utilities to uh, like pre-install, uh, but the, the process of walking through and making a domain, if you're only doing it twice a year, it's not all that much hassle. Uh, and frankly, in, in a lab environment, I disable automatic updates because I want to not be bothered, right? This is the, the VM I started up just once every few months for a lesser used one. I don't want to spend the next few hours doing Windows updates. Uh, so I honestly disable Windows updates to make it easier, and I don't install Windows servers all that often. And that, that helps me personally. And then if you can, uh, having uh, MSDN or a, a legit license on the Windows server side, that way you can make your domain controller just kind of make it once. They don't come out with new versions of server all that often. So uh, Jeff, here's a question I think a lot of people may have. Is, uh, is there a way you can pay a premium somewhere to have like the bulk setup finished so that way you can just get to the doing the stuff in the lab? So not setting up the lab, but just having a lab. Uh, so uh, rephrasing the question a bit, is it possible to have somebody else pre-configure this lab for you so you can just walk through? Uh, for any particular lab, yes, kind of. But some of these labs like that, that basic enterprise lab I walked through, those are so flexible because of all you can do with it. So um, in this bonus section coming up, I have a number of questions, prompts to start off a, a lab. Yes, other people can make it, but one, I think there's value in having walked through the admin side of things to see what the problems are. And two, uh, yes, you can walk through some specific scenario, but I far prefer being able to build your own scenarios because that's how you answer your own questions that come up. So uh, I, I, go ahead. Uh, here's a fantastic question as someone who's married to a malware analysis person. Uh, if <laughs> doing malware analysis, what extra precautions with a home lab would you use? You know, wouldn't want to let the malware out. Yes. So uh, how do I prevent malware from escaping my virtual machine? So one, if you're running malware inside a virtual machine, you have to admit that if, if this malware happens to have some VMware escape built in, you probably shouldn't be examining it in your home lab. That said, I think it's extremely, like, that's on the theoretical side, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and for uh, the question of specifically uh, malware labs, this is the one time I'd say uh, do those uh, uh, labeled networks, the ones I mentioned before, VMNet versus uh, labeled networks, um, because it, your host doesn't have access to them, right? So you have the uh, malware PFSense VM that just routes between the NAT side and this one isolated network. That way, uh, it can't get to the internet unless PFSense is running, and it can only get to the internet if PFSense is running, not your own machine, not any other machines that you don't put in that same uh, labeled subnet. All right, uh, one question. more question, and then we'll move on. Michael uh, asked, what do you use for orchestration of VMs? Do you suggest any good open source orchestration frameworks? Uh, so as far as orchestration, so, uh, I'm going to take that as things like Puppet, for example, right, with uh, pre-configuring or Ansible. Um, honestly, because it's a home lab and I'm only doing this task once, we've all seen the, uh, 
see if I have time to mention the XKCD on uh, automation, right? The, the theory is you automate it and then you start gaining time thereafter. Uh, because most of the home lab tasks tend to be one-off, I don't find that automation is much of a win. That said, uh, when I do use uh, automation tools for work, uh, we tend to use Ansible um, just because it's more flexible and it's not agent-based, unlike Puppet. Good question. All right, I think you said we should probably do a little bit of uh, extra stuff. So first thing first, hey, I'm also a science instructor, and I also have some courses coming up. Uh, so in the September, I'm teaching in Baltimore, Security 560 Network Pen Test. Then I fly over to Brussels, Belgium, which is going to be awesome, uh, October 16th to 21st, back to San Francisco in end of November, and then January, February, uh, SANS Las Vegas, which is not SANS Network Security. And then in February, I'm back to San Diego, and then, uh, that's my, geez, luckily I have two out of five that are uh, West Coast things. All right, as far as bonus content, right, for those who have stuck around to make it to the end, this bonus content, right? So for phishing purposes, this is more on the offensive side, but it's bonus, so I can go into that. All right, you probably could use a Gmail account. However, you, and, and you'll make it through some filters with that just fine. Problem is you'll probably get banned quite heavily and quite quickly. Um, for your own home lab purposes, you don't need Exchange. You don't need an on-site mail server. You just need an email that one of your clients can access. So Thunderbird pointing at Yandex Mail if you want to use your own uh, uh, mail server or, or your own uh, domain. Yandex.com uh, has free email even with your custom DNS, uh, your custom domain. All right, as far as phishing in particular, uh, what happens if, uh, if you register a new domain and send a, an email out, you're probably not going to make it through. Um, and in fact, if someone tries to browse HTTP, HTTPS to your web server on some domain, uh, a lot of people have filtering in place, right? Uh, the best way around filtering uh, overall is using a domain that's already been filtered, right? It's already been categorized. So you go to expiredmains.net, find some domain <laughs> you can create a phishing campaign around. And I tend to prefer uh, very short names because I can make any subdomain I want, right? I can make email-delivery.ytxrf.com after I purchased ytxrf.com as an expired domain. That's already been categorized as something that I think is likely to make it through. Um, if you want to spend a few more dollars, you wait until you find one that uh, is in the Alexa top million is in top one million sites by popularity, those still, those still do expire from time to time. So you have a categorized site. So think of this from a command and control perspective, right? You have outbound HTTPS with a valid signing certificate. You can use, uh, um, it'll come to me in a moment, uh, for a free SSL certificate. And it's still not coming to me. Jeez, somebody can paste it in the chat. That one that I'm thinking of that I, I can't think of offhand. Um, so outbound HTTPS to a legit SSL cert that's been categorizing the Alexa top million that uses your proxy as normal. How do you capture that, right? That's an interesting question to ask, answer in a home lab because honestly, uh, from a defender's point of view, I'm a bit of a privacy enthusiast, but I could not justify not doing SSL interception in the workplace. Hey, hey, it saddens yeah. me. Yes. Everyone said let's encrypt. Let's just yeah, say that. that's the one. Thank you. So let's encrypt is what I'm picking up for free 90 day certificates, which 90 days is far more than my average phishing campaign. So I don't even have to set up the automation. Thanks. Thank you, guys, for mentioning that in the chat. Yeah. All right. Coming up next, as far as defensive lab projects, um, please, please, please take a look at Microsoft Local Admin Password Solution. Um, this is kind of the, the way to solve the problem of the local admin password is nice and complex, but it's the same everywhere. Because even though Microsoft pushed that patch, the, the cure for the pass the hash problem, they still, there's an exception for the local RID 500, the built-in administrator account. So if I can get to one box on your domain and it has the same local admin password as other machines, I dump that hash, I don't care what the password is, I pass the hash to other domain joined machines. This right here is about, you know, I, I give it kind of hand wavy odds of maybe a third of pen tests. This is the way they get domain admin. Because eventually I'll find some workstation that some domain admin or some help desk admins installed, uh, logged in on, steal their password or password hash, and it's over from there. All right, another project I'd like to highlight is Proc Filter. 
from GoDaddy. And I, I get paid for nothing out of this entire webcast, for the record. Not even the Natex site that I mentioned before. Uh, proc filter is nice for the problem of stuff that just came in your enterprise that your antivirus isn't flagging. How can you immediately block that, um, especially in a flexible way, across your entire enterprise? So it's running Yara rules in memory on your remote Windows machine. This is not replacement for antivirus. This is, for example, if you've seen lots of different variants of, for example, ransomware that's touching your systems. And yes, you, can, you have good backups, hopefully. So you can restore, but if you wanted to kind of block them from running in the first place, you could do, uh, generate Yara rules, and I like Yara gen for that, using all the variants of this ransomware you've seen so far, and it will recommend uh, some Yara rules, which are uh, flexible ways of describing the malware. So it might be that it has a string inside, or some characteristics about the EXE itself, um, but it runs the in-memory version, so after it's kind of decompressed and such, in case it's encoded somehow, and you can do uh, flexible rules there. Maybe it's uh, immediately kill this process, maybe it's just alert, um, maybe it's yeah, not allowed in the first place if it's cmd.exe spawned by PowerPoint, for example. The other thing I like to mention, uh, Security Onion, right, pre-built suite for the network forensic side for the most part, uh, but I strongly recommend on the internal side of your border, at 10 terabytes plus of cheap disk, right? Uh, there was a sale, Monoprice had, uh, this uh, actually went out of sale already, uh, but they had $40 for uh, three terabytes used enterprise drives. Uh, Best Buy has the eight terabyte disk for like 180 bucks, 160 bucks. All right, buy a bunch of cheap, cheap disk, throwing it in some old server and doing a network tap at your border is really nice when it comes to, hey, in case of breach, have several months worth or weeks worth or days worth of prior uh, packet captures you can analyze it. Plus, of course, you can do things like Bro or Snort for intrusion detection <laughs> as well. Really useful stuff. All right? And then uh, Security Onion by itself, uh, if you tell it where to save those PCAPs, it will actually rotate out and delete old ones as necessary, uh, just so you know. So you don't have to worry about running out of disk space. It manages that automatically. All right. Questions? No, Jeff, we're at, we're at our time for today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. And uh, Jeff, thank you so much for Absolutely. Uh, one question. Thank one. you all for joining. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, where will the blog be? And I just want to let everyone know it's going to be on the Pentest blog, uh, most likely, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, pen-testing.sans.org or whichever it is. Or the top result for a Googling pen testing fan blog. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol. Uh, once again, Jeff, thank you so much. Carol, it is up to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeff and Jason, for your great presentation, which helps bring thank this you. content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.